so true love is eternal. Of all the things we want to teach or teach you or share with mankind is that true love is eternal. It's very important. Now, usually we have musical inspiration here, but unfortunately the band isn't able to join us today. So I thought for musical ins for inspiration, we'll see, uh, we'll watch a YouTube video. One of the things we're suggesting to people strongly, one of the things that's actually happening is a renaissance in science. Science is changing in the 21st century to become, to recognize the supernatural and the spiritual. So today we're going to share a message from hospice nurse Martha Atkins. She's a death researcher. Actually, she's not, not only a nurse, but she's researching death based upon the death of her mother and other people she knew. She's studying experiences of the dying. This talk will explain deathbed phenomena and present ongoing research about the topic. Accounts from the dying and bedside witnesses will be shared. So if you're scared, <coughs> you're, you're fairly warned. Anyhow, let's watch this. So you guys ready? Not blue Swede, no, sorry. Here, but here we go. Okay, she's starting. Can you hear? Jim had been gone about 13 years. He had died some 13 years before, and, and I expected him to be there. I'd had a dream that he was sitting in a chair, his legs crossed, reading a book. So I said, Mom, where's Jim? Oh, he's been right here. The night she died, my mom was reaching up towards something I couldn't see, and I didn't know then that that was part of the deathbed phenomenon until I began my research. And here's some other things I learned. For six centuries, Anecdotal accounts and a little bit of research have detailed the auditory, visual, and tactile experiences of those nearing death. Most often, people are uh, met by friends or family members. The, the purpose seems to be to help the dying person with the death experience, and most often these visions are comforting. People see angels, people see religious entities that are important to them culturally, so you may see the Buddha or uh, the Virgin Mary or uh, Yama, the Hindu god of death. People see landscapes. People hear music. Kids have kid-friendly visions. There's a story about a, a hospice. There was a pediatric hospice here in San Antonio in the 80s. And the story went that there was a boy there that was dying. He complained to the nurse about the noise in the corner, the noisy boys in the corner. And the nurse looked over the noise and they invited. She said, who's there? And he named off three names of three kids who had been at the hospice before he got there. Mm. Mm. These experiences happen all over the world, all religion, all cultures, all ages. They happen to people who are blind, they happen to people who are deaf. Some researchers say, this is the limbic system going crazy, these are purely hallucinations, um, these are embedded memories of a lifetime that are coming out. Others say, this is proof of the soul's existence after death. Neither side can prove their hypothesis. And my conjecture is this. It doesn't matter. Sorry for all the scientists in the room. It doesn't matter why they happen. It matters that they do. 
in my research, I talked with people who were at the bedside when somebody was dying. One wife said to me, she was talking to her husband one afternoon and said, do you ever see anybody or hear anybody? She said in her estimation, he was completely lucid. He had had a little bit of pain medication. He was doing a Sudoku puzzle. And he said, yeah, there's a soldier that comes and stands by my bed at night and keeps me company. Can't you just see him there standing in the kitchen? And there's a dog that come, comes and lays by my feet in the afternoon. And he went on to describe a beloved family pet that had been theirs early in their marriage. Witnesses in my research talked about how they saw something happening and they knew they didn't need to do anything about it. So when Mrs. Harrison walked in and saw Mr. Harrison talking to somebody, she was a little perplexed, but she asked him about it. He was terrified to die. He had been horribly abused as a child. Terrified to die. Afraid his family was going to come. Instead, on the scene came this seven-year-old boy named Jimmy. Mrs. Harrison said she went with it. She said, I really didn't know what else to do. I just went with it. And Jimmy stayed with Mr. Harrison the last two weeks of his life and kept him company and helped his transition be an easier one and knew of his world. Witnesses talked about how they recognized that the phenomenon that were happening were signs that death was near, even when experts said that wasn't the case. They saw the signs. And they knew the difference between hallucinations and visions. So hallucinations for them didn't have any kind of context and were frightening, anxiety-provoking, versus the visions, which did have a context and brought great comfort. When I work with families now, I tell them, your person may see things you can't see, they may hear things you can't see, they may reach up to the sky, they may look through you. They may talk in metaphors about moving or leaving or going. Even though they're bedbound, they need their shoes or they need their map or they need their purse or they need to get to the stadium, they gotta get somewhere. One mom said, just before her three-year-old died, he said, Daddy, the train's here. For that mom, and for other folks in my research, these visions, these deathbed phenomena were of great comfort to them. When, when we educate families about these experiences and when we educate the patient about these experiences, there's less fear. And my goodness, we need less fear on death and I. I had the opportunity to work with a family named Butch, which was 94. He had congestive heart failure and he decided he needed to go on hospice. He was ready. I got a text one afternoon from his daughter that the visions had started and everything was okay. His daughter talked about how Butch was often in the other room and this is the language she used for him being there talking with the unseen versus over here talking to the daughter and the other people who were in the room. And he was often in the other room. So one afternoon, I forgot to say, Butch, is, Butch was a pretty famous rugby player in South, that's South Africa in his day. So one afternoon, in the other room, the rugby team came to visit Butch. Mm -hmm. Now his family had also come, his parents had come, his brothers and sisters, but there's the rugby team. The rugby team had come in on really long ladders, <laughs> came down, stayed with them, they had a really big party, and then the rugby team left. They left shorter ladders, and Butch was ticked because the ladders were too short and he couldn't get up to where they were. <laughs> Another day he was ticked off because his suitcase was packed and he was ready to go. And they left at that. Another day, he held out his hand and he said to his daughter, I've got these machine parts. I don't want to lose them. This is a very common metaphor for the dying. There's some bigger whole picture and their piece is missing and they've got to make sure it's whole. She's, he's got these parts in his hand. And she went and got a Ziploc. Well, let me tell you why I love that. Because more often than not, People reach for medication to quell something they don't understand, and they miss an opportunity to connect with the person. They miss an opportunity to meet the dying person where they are. She didn't miss it. Is any of this real? I say yes. Yes, it's real because it's real to the people it happens to. I don't know how to measure those things that are beyond our ordinary human capacity for understanding. I, I'm a researcher, I don't know how to measure wonder. I know what it feels like. I do know what it feels like. And I 
know I feel great comfort myself and I think that my mom didn't leave this world by herself. And the boy got to go on that train and which had his buddies around before he left. When I meet people at parties for the first time, think how much fun that is. What do you do for a living? <laughs> Me and the sex girl and the bacteria guy can all go together to the party. <laughs> so we, I, I meet them, and this is this. This happens. It is. Gosh, that's really nice. <laughs> <laughs> or something happens like having lunch today. Let me tell you a story. I've been scared to tell anybody because I didn't want anybody to think I was crazy. And I say, oh my goodness, I want to hear your story. Please tell me your story. It's these stories, yours and mine, that are going to bring comfort and hope. six words before he died. October 5th, 2001, he died. I want to invite you to engage in your own sense of wonder as I leave you today. Minds wide open for Steve Jobs' last words. Oh, wow. Hold on a second, let me turn this off. Yeah, Martha Atkins. Yes. Okay, her name is Martha Atkins. You can Google her or look her up on YouTube. Now, the interesting thing to, to me about these things is when I have this dream all the time. By the way, I have my top. Oh, sorry. Just stop. Stop, go away, it's okay now, rest. Okay, so uh, one, of the, one of the things Jesus taught us and true parents teach us constantly is to not be afraid of dying. But that's going to be, you're going to go there, God's going to take care of you, Jesus is going there to prepare a place for you. True parents said thousands of your ancestors are going to celebrate your coming to the spirit world with you. And so we should be able to recognize that the one caveat they always make is, Jesus said, you must build up for yourselves treasures in heaven. What do treasures in heaven look like? Reverend Moon says this, the treasures in heaven that you need are the, the first and foremost, the fundamental four position foundation. As close as you can get to that. Your own personal growth with God. As close as you can get to God, you should get to God. And number three, your tribe. Who loves you? Who do you love outside of your family? Who are your friends, your neighbors, the uh, ministers you witness to, your, your family? Who are they? Collect them. Love them and take care of them. It's really important, by the way. Here's a... Uh, so her name is Martha Atkins. And actually, there's several testimonies of hospice workers on there that are pretty, pretty amazing. And uh, the interesting to me is she does this as research. It isn't just anecdotal evidence that she's collecting. She's actually examining the stories, examining their medications, examining their life stories, and, and putting them together for us. These were some of the comments at the YouTube site. For example, a person wrote in, this is awesome to watch. I have been with three people that have died, with the most profound being my mother. She saw people, angels, and even had what looked like a life review while I watched. She even told me something that the others in the room had seen me do when she was asleep. She mentioned a silver cord that she saw that connected me to her and to every living creature on earth that all connected us to God. There was a lot of spiritual energy going on at that time that I won't get into, but I will say that she told us that she was waiting for Joe to come and get her. He was my dad who had died six years before her. So we're going to be connected. We're going to be connected as powerfully as we can love each other is the power of our connection. 
right? Reverend Moon said the most important thing, the greatest thing is if you love people in Africa and you love people in Australia and you love people of other races and backgrounds and other religions, then you're able to freely travel everywhere in the spiritual world. You can go everywhere people love you, that's where you can go. Here's another one. Another, there's a comment based on that. She says, my wife died on her second anniversary and I haven't been able to shake the need to know how she is. Even both of us being agnostic, I can't comprehend her suddenly uh, exiting, right? Here's a guy who says, look, I don't believe in God. I have no knowledge of God. Nevertheless, I can't accept that she's not still alive, right? That's important uh, and powerful. He said, she pointed upward several times just before dying, which startled me because neither of us had any afterlife beliefs. So now I'm studying. I hope you find some comfort here. Rest in peace, little Kelly. We love you. So this is the condition we live on earth. As we relate to death and dying, we relate to the spiritual world. And ideally, we come to understand that God has created the spirit world, and the spirit world is waiting for us to have a good experience. Now, you're probably thinking, well, it's great that these people had their experiences, but how about scientists who don't believe in God? Wouldn't it be great if a materialistic, atheist neurosurgeon went to the spirit world and came back to tell us about it? Well, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> this is, uh, doctor, this is uh, uh, Dr. Eben Alexander, who's a trained neurosurgeon, materialist and atheist who did die, did go to the spirit world, and came back to tell us about it. This was a Newsweek article, but you can read his book. His book is far more complete in his experiences than uh, is the article. He says this, I know that many of my peers hold, as I myself did, that the theory that the brain, and particularly the cortex, generates consciousness. And we live in a universe devoid of any kind of emotion. The idea is that even if there was a god, He's like uh, the blind watchmaker. He doesn't know what he's doing. There's no feeling of God, like a deist type. Uh, but here, there, this is what his experience. This theory is the basis of behavior psychology and psychopharmacology. This is him as a neurosurgeon. I did not believe in the phenomena of near-death experience. I grew up in this so-called scientific world, the son of a neurosurgeon. I understand what happens to the brain when people are near death, and I had always believed here uh, there were good scientific explanations for the heavenly out-of-body journeys described by those who had narrowly escaped death. So he always thought the same thing. It's just a hallucination. There's something going on. There's some oxygen in the brain or something like that. In the fall of 2008, the human part of my brain, the neocortex, was inactivated. I experienced something so profound that it gave me a scientific reason to believe in consciousness after death. That is, he was in a coma for seven days. And the interesting thing was, He's a neurosurgeon. So he read his own, after he came back, he read his own, uh, what do they call it, his own charts. That, that and he knew exactly his brain was dead while he was visiting heaven and seeing angels and doing all these different kinds of things. So he knew exactly it wasn't a hallucination. That's what's really beautiful about this. What's his name? His name is Eben Alexander. Eben, Eben, Eben. He says, I know that many of my peers hold, as I myself did, that, that to the theory that the brain, in particular the cortex, generates consciousness and we live in a universe devoid of any emotion. But now he knows that's not true. Consciousness lives outside the brain, outside the physical body. But as far as I know, no one has ever traveled to this dimension while, one, their cortex was completely shut down. So this is recorded. His, the, 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 uh, yeah, his brain was monitored, and they know exactly. There was no electrical activity in his brain at all. He was in a coma. He was essentially dead, right? And while their body was under minute medical observation, his mind was for the full seven days of his coma. He says, with no ability, there could be no mechanical ability to think. So he could understand his mind was outside of his body, independent of his body, right? With no REM, no heart fluctuation, no brain activity, no chemical reactions were taking place during his experience. He says, what was his experience? The neurosurgeon now confidently believes that another dimension exists. He describes it, describes it as a world where we are much more than our brains and bodies, and where death is not the end of consciousness, but rather a chapter in a vast and incalculably positive journey. Remember, he's a doctor. 
Oh, Vince, how are you? Uh, because you didn't set your clock back. Anyway, he had, his, he had an incredibly positive experience in, uh, in a spiritual dimension, right? He says it was a place of big, puffy, pink-white clouds, and high above were flocks of transparent, shimmering beings arced across the sky, leaving long streamer-like lines behind them, so describing kind of angelic presence. He also heard a booming sound like a glorious chant from above, which he later concluded came out of an uncontainable joy from these creatures. He said, it seemed that you could not look at or listen to anything in this world without becoming a part of it, without joining with it in some mysterious way, he says, a kind of world of oneness, right? We live on this physical earth, and we say Bible teaches us that Satan is the god of this world. We've never seen a world where God is in complete dominion. We will. We will, we hope to see that world, but we haven't seen it. And so he's describing a place. By the way, he's a neurosurgeon. What does he do with his life as a neurosurgeon? He saves other people's lives, right? Uh, that's, he spends his whole life saving other people's lives. Why else would he have a, such a great, wonderful experience? He says, interestingly, a young woman with deep blue eyes was, it, was with him for most of his journey. Together he rode on the wing of a butterfly and was surrounded by millions of butterflies. The woman spoke to him, but without using any words, he recalls. She said, as if translated to earthly languages, you are loved and cherished dearly forever. So that was, and, and he said, it's not words. I wasn't hearing words. I was feeling intensely loved. And if you read his book, you'll discover that he later realized that that's his long-lost sister, twin sister who had passed away, uh, and he, never had, he had never met her. He says, uh, then it goes on, and she says to him, you have nothing to fear. There is nothing you could do wrong, right? The message went through me like a wind, and I instantly understood that it was true. I knew so in the same way that I knew that the world around us is very real, was not some fantasy passing and unsubstantial, he states. So he's a neuro, well, this is what we want, right? A materialist neurosurgeon who goes to the spirit world, comes back from his near-death experience, and testifies to God, angels, and all the things we believe in. <clears throat> he states, The materialist picture of the body and brain as the producers rather than the vehicles of human consciousness is doomed, he says. In its place, a new view of mind and body will emerge, and in fact is emerging already. This view is scientific and spiritual in equal measure and will value what the greatest scientists of history themselves have always valued above all, and that is truth. So I want to explain that I believe in this time and age, in our century, our 21st century, science will change. Things will change. The understanding of God's will will change. When Jesus left, what did he say? I'm making all things new. And all things are now becoming very new in the world with a new understanding and idea where people will now grasp the idea of God, not only through religion, but through science as well. We say consciousness and the mind are supernatural. Remember last week I gave you a, a message about the supernatural mind. The mind is supernatural. But also we understand the Big Bang, the origin of creation, the first moment of creation is also supernatural, right? All scientific, not all, but m many scientists are now beginning to agree that the cr creation story is a supernatural story, right? That fine-tuning of the universe is supernatural. That science is discovering that quantum mechanics is supernatural. Read Planck, by the way. He says, for example, there's no there there. There's no real solid matter as we know it. Only a mind, a super intellect that controls the universe. It's Planck, one of the greatest scientists of all human history, right? DNA is supernatural. We believe, and I believe, there's a renaissance of scientific discoveries that will help people to understand the nature of God and the nature of spiritual world and the purpose of spiritual world, which is, of course, to live forever in God's love. Okay, this is a bit about fine-tuning and atheism. The recently discovered fine-tuning of the creation of our universe, for example, astrophysicists now know that the values of the four fundamental forces, gravity, the electromagnetic force, Strong and weak nuclear forces were determined less than one millionth of a second after the Big Bang. So they understand laws of mind came before physical matter, right? 
alter any one value and the universe could not exist. For instance, if the ratio between the nuclear strong force and the electromagnetic force had been off, been off by the tiniest fraction of the tiniest fraction, by even one part in a quad, that's a quadrillion, by the way, if you want to count, then, then no stars could have formed at all. Feel free to gulp. Multiply that single parameter by all the other necessary conditions and the odds against the universe existing are so heart-stoppingly astronomical that the notion of it all just happened defies common sense. So this is what the scientists now who are studying the Big Bang are coming to understand and accept. That, that this wasn't, there's no accident to the universe. It was, it's a creative place. It's not a wild explosion because things don't, right? If you blow things up, they, you know, if you blow up things, they don't form into a car. If you go to the car junkyard and you put a big bomb in the junkyard, it doesn't form itself into an automobile that can drive with a key in it for you to drive it. It doesn't happen. So these are just some of the constants, by the way. And the parameters, this is the least, the, the ratio of electrons to protons. If there was one more electron in the universe than protons, to the 10 to the 37th power, which is a number you can't imagine how big it is, the universe couldn't have developed. The accuracy of electrons to protons is 10 to the 37th power. There's not even one different. Isn't that amazing? It's unbelievable. And that's the least one. The other one's electro, uh, ratio of electromagnetic force to gravity, 10 to the 40th. Expansion rate of the universe, 10 to the 55th. Mass density of the universe, 10 to the 59th. It's just unbelievable. These numbers are all unbelievable, right? These numbers represent the maximum possible deviation. If they had deviated any more than this, the universe could not have developed. And so that's why many scientists are now changing their mind. And by the way, there's all kinds of these, right? This is from Dr. Hugh Ross. He said, the, the degree of fine-tuning is difficult to imagine. Hugh Ross gives an example of the least fine-tuned of the above four examples of his book, The Creator and the Cosmos, which is reproduced here. By the way, Dr. Ross, if you read his biography, was an atheist all his life, grew up in an atheist ho household. But when he came to the university to study cosmology, he came to the conclusion that there must be an intellect. Then he studied all the, all the religions to find out what the intellect is like, and he became a Christian. Because he said the biblical story of creation, Genesis, is the only story that conforms to scientific evidence of how the world created. That there be light, then there was light, then there was this, then there was that. He said, one part in 10 to the 37th power is such an incredibly sensitive balance that it is hard to visualize. The following analogy might help. Cover the entire North American continent in dimes all the way up to the moon a height of about 230,000 miles. So how many dimes is that? <laughs> Anyhow. Next, pile dimes from here to the moon on a billion other continents the same size as America. Paint one dime red and mix it into the billions of piles of dimes. Blindfold a friend and ask him to pick out one dime, the one red dime. The odds that he picks out that red dime are 10 to the 37th power. Right? It's impossible. So this is what's happening to the scientific community. They're seeing through mathematics, an actual vision of the mind or intellect of the creator and how hard it is for the creator to make the world, right? <clears throat> and by the way, there's, all, there's stacks of parameters, right? That, and that, those are only the top four. If you, if you look through this, you can see that there's parameters after parameters. We could just go on for hours explain all the various parameters to create the universe. But I won't do that. Thank you. You can look that up yourself. Fine-tuning parameters of the universe. You can look that up yourself. Okay, so we say, we say, <clears throat> and this is a prediction, we say that science is changing in the 21st century. Toward a unity of science, spirituality, and true love. That God's will is coming out into the universe. Uh, people are studying and understanding the idea of family and true love and all these things that the new scientific community will be different than the old scientific community. The, the, for example, the degree to which the constants of physics must match a precise criteria is such that a number of agnostic scientists have concluded that there is some sort of supernatural plan or agency with a, with a capital A, meaning God, behind it. Here's what they say. Here's some of the quotes from previously agnostic or atheistic scientists. I'll read you a few of them. George Greenstein, astronomer, as we survey all the evidence, the thought inst ins insistently arises 
that some supernatural agency or rather agency must be involved. Is it possible that suddenly without intending to we have stumbled upon scientific proof of the existence of a supreme being? Was it God who stepped in and so providentially crafted the cosmos to our benefit, right? Agnostic science. How about this one? Here's Ed Harris in Cosmology. Here is a cosmological proof of the existence of God. The design argument of Paley. Paley's the guy who said, in the beginning of the 19th century, said, if I came upon a, a heath, he called it a heath, a, a, a field, and I kicked a rock, I may think that rock was there for, for millions of years. But if I came upon the same uh, place and there was a gold watch that was still ticking, I would have to believe. I could believe that the rock got there by nature, but I could not believe that a, claw, a watch that's still ticking accidentally got there by nature. That, you know, all the. It had to be created by an intelligent being for use by an intelligent being. Mm -hmm. So he says this is what they're discovering about the universe. Uh, the fine tuning of the universe provides a pr prima facie evidence of deistic design. Take your choice. Blind chance that requires multitudes of universes or design that requires only one. Many scientists, when they admit their views, incline toward the teleological design argument. So he says it's not easy for scientists to say they believe in a god or creator of the universe. But if you corner them and talk to them personally, they'll, they say, well, look, you know, sure looks like that's what happened. Fred Hoyle, the astronomer who coined the term Big Bang, said that his atheism was greatly shaken at these developments. He later wrote that a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with the physics as well as with chemistry and biology. The numbers one calculates when the facts seem to be so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. So he's still questioning, right? But it just, it just seems impossible to not believe in a god when you begin to study nature. Theoretical physicist Paul Davies has said that the appearance of design is overwhelming. And Oxford professor Dr. John Lennox has said, the more we get to know about our universe, the more the hypotheses that there is a creator gains an incredibility, gains incredibility as the best explanation of why we're here. So there's a scientific community. These aren't Christians or religious leaders telling you God exists. These are the so-called scientists of the world, right? Alan Sandage, winner of the Crawford Prize in Astronomy. I find it quite improbable that such, an, such order came out of chaos. There has to be some organizing principle. God, to me, is a mystery, but is the explanation for the miracle of existence why there is something instead of nothing. You know, I could go on for a long time. Frank Kipler, professor of mathematical physics. When I began my career as a cosmologist some 20 years ago, I was, con I was a convinced atheist. I never in my wildest dreams imagined that one day I would be writing a book purporting to show that the central claims of Judeo-Christian theology are in fact true, that these claims are straightforward deductions of the laws of physics as we now understand them. I have been forced into these conclusions by the inexorable logic of my own special branch of physics. Note, Chipper Sense has actually converted to Christianity Hence his latest book, The Physics of Christianity. If you want to read about the physics of Christianity. It's a long, hard book to read, believe me. I, I did read it, but it was a real... He is a physicist, and it is uh, hard. Anyhow, however, the great goal of creation doesn't end with electrons and protons. We're not just talking about electrons and protons. The creator of the universe isn't a scientist who's inventing a universe because he likes electrons and protons, or planets, or rocks, or things like that. This is about true love. We say the goal of creation is that the creator seeks a partner, seeks a love partner. All the other things in creation, the planets are great, stars are great, hydrogen is wonderful, but all those things are for an end, that God has a partner, that God has children in the world. Genesis 127 says that God created man in his own image. And in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. This is the goal of creation. The goal of creation isn't light. The goal of creation is children in his own image, who are just like him. Right? This is what one from Reverend, Reverend Moon's sermons. He says this. God invested every ounce of his great energy. Every bit of himself was poured into the act of creating this universe. God invested all of himself in his creation. He did not reserve even one ounce of energy. Remember? At the end of the six days, what does it say God does? He rests. How come? If he's not tired, well, why is he resting? 
So we think that, no, God doesn't have a body like you and me that gets tired, that has a, a, a lack of vox capability, right? We don't believe that. He doesn't have lactic acid build up and then he feels tired. But it takes tremendous mental energy to create the universe, right? God rested because he was, it was a sign that he gave all his love, all his mind, all his intellect to create the universe that we live in. And that's what that means. That's why we need to be grateful to God. You know, sometimes we think God just said the magic word, let there be light, and there was light. Well, it's okay if you want to think that way. But really, you should think. God had tremendous hurt. and had to really wrestle with the elements to make light so that you could see. That you could see the beauty of flowers and stars and all these different kinds of things. Right? Creation was his total labor, his total effort of giving all of himself. When God put his entire heart and soul into the creation of his object, he was investing 100% of himself. Only in this way could he create his second self, the visible God, human beings created in the image of God. That was God told for man, 73. Here's another one. He says, God is the root of all love. If God is the creator, and in the creation we see love, then where does it come from? Love must come from the creator. God is love. That root is therefore most dedicated and serious. In common Christian understanding, God simply said, one day let there be light and snap. It happened while God lay back and rested. Then he said, let the oceans rise and so on, and the rest of creation happened without much effort. But really, we believe strongly. That's why we have a Sabbath, to remember. Somebody cares about you enough to create an entire universe for you to be born in. That is, man is God's substantial object with his dual characteristics manifested as direct image, while all other things in the universe are substantial objects of God with his dual characteristics manifested as its indirect image. So everything else is a symbol of God. But human beings are different, completely different creation than all other things. Why? Because we, we not only have intellect, different from all other animals, but we have love different from all other animals, don't we? Do, human, do other animals have pets? Do other animals raise plants and take, cultivate plants and learn all about... No! Why do we do that? Because we love dogs, right? Or we love cats. Some of us love cats, God bless them. We love all the animals, right? We have zoos full of elephants and hippopotami and crocodiles even. We love crocodiles. I'm particularly fond of crocodiles myself. Such an incredible animal. Anyway. All kinds of animals, right? Humans have not only intellect to understand everything in the image of God, but more importantly, more importantly, we have a heart that can love all of God's creations, right? When we go to the beach, we love the beach. When we go to the mountains, we love the mountains. When we go to see trees, we love trees. When we see the desert, we love the desert. When we look up at night and it's the stars, we, we love the stars, right? We have in us an ability to love all the things God made. Dogs and cats don't look up to see the star. Sorry. Right? If, if you drive down to the cliffs to see the sunset over the ocean, you won't see any animals walking there to watch the sunset. Wow, it's so beautiful. Hurf, hurf, hurf. Meow, meow. Animals don't go to watch the sunset. They don't see the beauty. They can't love all things of nature like you can. So we're different. We're a different creation that God makes. Right? We're a different creation. So we say there's a theory of the origin of the universe that it looks like this, right? There's a single dot, and from that dot, from nothing, comes a whole universe. It grows like this, right? From that dot, it grows. This is called the Big Bang Theory. First, there was a, a spot, and then it grows and grows and grows into the present universe with all kinds of galaxies. And it looks like this. It looks like a big, uh, big balloon. That's how physics, physicists does figure the universe is a giant circle, giant sphere, right, with a... With, we're, somewhere, we're somewhere in the middle. They don't know where we're at in the middle, by the way. But they know we're in the middle. You know what this is? Yeah, exactly. That's you. This is you, a tiny egg in your mother's womb until your mother and father experience a big bang called true love. After that big bang, boom, you start to grow. You start to grow like a universe, right? Some parents in here experience that bang once in a while. Anyway, after the big bang of your parents' lovemaking, there's an enormous expansion of your universe from one single zygote to all the cells of your body, estimated at. Now, no one, if you go to Google or Wikipedia and ask how many cells are in the human body, 
you get numbers between 37 trillion and 400 trillion cells. Nobody can count them. Right? One, two, 700 trillion, 233 million. Nobody could actually count all the cells. They just think of a cell, weigh it, and then multiply it. But this is the same creation because it's the same creator God. Right? It's exactly the same thing from one single cell to 400 trillion cells you merge. Is this different than how the universe came into being? No, it's not different because there's one creator. From one single point, all the galaxies emerge. You are the image of God on a smaller scale, but nevertheless, it's all supernatural. God worked in, to make you as hard as he worked to make the universe. By the way, your single brain, they say, is more complex, has more neurons in it and more synapses in it than the entire galaxy, uh, and our entire galaxy of stars. Your one single brain is more complex than the, all, all the stars in one galaxy. Did you know that? It's amazing, but that's how God m can make you to love all things in the universe. See, you start off there, you multiply, you multiply, you get bigger, and then what do you do? You grow in a world of waters, right? The mother's, it's called a bag of waters in the mother's uh, side. And by the way, this is the same as creation. You here are in the waters, right? You're breathing water, you're swimming in water, you're in your mother's water. And at the beginning of creation, this is Genesis 1-2. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Just like God is looking when you're, you're inside your mother's womb and you're growing, God is hovering over you, right? Don't all of us, when our, like we had a, a grandson born, when your grandchildren are born or your children are born, you're all hovering over, over the mother's womb, right? Everywhere you go, if a pregnant woman comes in, everyone's looking at her. Oh, she's special. She's special. She's with child. That's special in our, in our uh, culture, right? Same. Same with God. It's special. And you grow and you grow and you grow. And then finally you're born. We see at that moment of your birth, everyone is in awe. Right? One of the things I always teach is when I walk into a room, when I walk into the room here, how many people will think, oh, I believe in God. There must be a God. Nobody, right? But when a baby is born, when a baby is born, don't we all think, ah, I believe in God. Who could have created this cute, beautiful, little, perfect baby? It must be God. There must be a God because your heart and soul and everything in you rejoices and feels hope and, uh, and gladness, right? Right? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Gosh, jeez. What does it take? Uh, so this is what Reverend Moon says. Were you born in despair and darkness? Or were you born with hope, a goal, and a purpose? Purpose is to live forever in God's kingdom, right? The families and friends and relatives surround that baby with their hope. The baby's father and mother feel hope to their child, and his whole family hopes that someday he'll become a good and fulfilled and faithful person, right? Even God has that hope. Even God himself has that hope when you're born. This is why the birth of a child is an event of joy and celebration. If people feel that way about the birth of a new child, then God would certainly feel the same when Adam and Eve were created. <coughs> they were surrounded by the utmost hope and joy. All the things of creation gave their entire attention to them, including God, looking forward to the day of their accomplishment. Right? And that's the mother who just went through all the pangs of labor, but only could feel tremendous joy and love for her child. Right? Same here. Look at this mother kissing her baby. She's completely, totally in love. And that's how you feel, by the way. If you kids haven't had a child yet. You don't know what it feels like. When you're holding your baby, your child is just born, yes, you absolutely acknowledge God. This must be heaven. This must be a part of what heaven's like. <clears throat> so we say the fine-tuning of the universe shows that God spent unbelievable accuracy and mental energy to create the universe for his children and all humankind. But listen to this. How much more is God investing in you? God invests in you more than investing in a creation where the smallest deviation is 10 to the 37th power. He cares about you more than that. Right? And by the way, it's true that there are some random evil events in the world that might make you doubt God. Accidents, terrorism, or whatever it happens to be. On the other hand, there is good that you can count on every single day in God's universe. For example... Every day the sun's going to rise and you're going to, the sun's going to rise to warm you tomorrow morning too. God set it in the heavens and there's nothing that's going to stop it. Right? The moon replenishes the oceans every day. 
Air recirculates between plants and animals every day. You don't have to worry about no air. God created a system where all the air you need is constantly cleaned and replenished by the plants. Isn't that amazing? Yes. A perfect recirculation system. Water is repurified automatically every day for you and comes down as pure rain. Every day flowers bloom, trees grow, babies are born. These are the concrete expressions of God's love for you on the earth. For every human being, every human being, the sun shines on everybody. Rain falls on everyone. Fresh, pure water falls on everybody. So I believe the 21st century will be a century of unity of science and religion. Right? Reverend Moon predicted the end of the Soviet Union when no one believed him. But he was right. The Soviet Union did fall because it's a, an ungodly, satanic system. Reverend Moon predicted this renaissance of science and religion and he will be proven correct. He will be proven correct. I believe the science of the family and uh, the true love in a family will become the natural culture of the world in this century. Uh, because we know, we know what it takes to raise children of true love, right? I am happy to see these scientists newly believing in God the Creator. New scientists study the cosmos and become Christians. God bless them. But more I thank you people who didn't have to study science to, to love and follow God, right? I'm more grateful to you who have believed from the beginning. And I'll leave you with two Bible verses. One, first, Luke Peter said, Behold, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times as much at this time and at the age to come in eternal life. Don't worry. We're covered. Number two, 1 Corinthians 2 9. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. Don't worry. We're going to be taken care of. God is going. You know, someday, I, I know, because I have this dream regularly, where we're all going to be in heaven together, having a great time, experience the true love of God firsthand. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. I appreciate you listening to me.